afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here for my talk. The subject of my talk today is profiling humans from their voice. And I would like to introduce this subject to you through an example. What if someone called you out of the blue and threatened to kill you, and they did that repeatedly? You've never heard the voice. What would you do? You would probably record the voice and take it to the police. What would the police do? There are hundreds there, of crimes. There's going to be three bombs today, one at Southern Courthouse. That was a bomb threat. There are hundreds of crimes that happen every day around the world through the medium of voice. Threats, harassments, extortion, ransom calls, hoax calls, and a lot more. What I'm going to do now is to play out a bomb threat to you. I want you to listen to the voice very carefully and try to form an opinion about the speaker. And then I will tell you a little bit about the speaker. And let's match our notes. Here, you County Sheriff's Office Dispatch, Robinson, how can I help you? Hello, sir, can you hear me fine? Yes, how can I help you? All right, listen to me very carefully, okay? All right, listen to me very carefully and don't interrupt me. I've got seven pipe bombs surrounding this theme park. Seven pipe bombs. The blast radius will go off within a 500 meter radius, killing everybody within it. The seven pipe bombs are located in on this closed location on Cedar Point. I'm not afraid to blow them up. I have an AK-47. If the bombs don't detonate in one hour, I'm gonna run in with my AK-47, killing everybody in the park. Do you understand? I'm sure you formed some opinion about the person. What if I told you that this person is white, he's Caucasian, he's brought up in America, probably in the Northwest. He's about 170 centimeters tall, he weighs about 72 kilograms. He's about 38 years old. He's high on cocaine. He's a heavy smoker. He's in a small room. The room has a wooden floor. The room has gypsum walls. There is a large glass window behind him. He's using a laptop to make the call, probably an IBM ThinkPad. There's a ceiling fan in the room, and so on. What if I told you that this is what he looks like, probably. What if I went one step ahead and told you that this is what he looks like? This is what I call profiling humans from their voice. How can we do this? It turns out we do this all the time. We make judgments about other people from their voices all the time. How many times have you met a friend or heard their voice over the phone and told that friend, you sound sad, you sound depressed, you sound happy, uh, and so on. We make these judgments all the time here. He sounded like a man who had slept well and didn't owe too much money. And we make these judgments so easily that we don't even realize it. A remarkable ride only here in America. I was born in. There's a lineup of people up there. Did you get who, did, did you, did you, understand or get who spoke, might have spoken that? Yes, you did, right? In that two seconds, you judged the person's gender, their age, their ethnicity, their state of mental health, their state of physical health. And we can do this because voice carries information. We just don't realize how much information voice carries. It carries information about your age, your, your physiological parameters, your physical stature, your height, weight, your health, your background, your personality, even about your environment. If you're in a room, there are signatures of the room in your voice, and we'll see examples of that. How big is the room? What's the ceiling made of? What's the floor made of? And so on and so forth. It's possible to extract all that. And the science of profiling uses artificial intelligence to find this information in the voice and to make predictions from it. Except that we hope the machines will do it much better because human hearing is not all that good. So we come to information now. The voice carries information, but where is that information? In order to understand where that information is, we need to understand a little bit about the voice production process. The human vocal tract is a vocal chamber, is a, is, a, is a resonance chamber, and 
if you imagine a building that looked like that and a little guy shouting into the building, what do you think you would hear? You would hear echoes, you would hear resonances, right? If I changed the shape of the, that building or the dimensions, what would happen? The nature of those echoes and resonances would change. So when we speak, air comes out of the lungs and it goes through two vocal cords in our larynx here. They're not really cords, they are folds. And they vibrate in response to the air creating a sound. And this sound resonates in your vocal chambers. We, we produce different sounds as we speak by changing the dimensions or the shape of the vocal chambers by moving our articulators, the, our, our tongue, lip, jaw, and so forth. And as we speak, we produce thousands of frequencies. We produce frequencies in the range of 50 to 6,800 hertz. What comes out as a result of this process is a pressure wave that looks like that, the signal on the top in time. And the picture below is its frequency content. On the y-axis, you have frequency, the thousands of frequencies that we produce. On the x-axis, you have time. And the color at any pixel is the energy in that frequency at that time. And these high energy patterns that you see throughout the picture are the resonances of your vocal chambers. So this is one representation of the speech signal. Where is the information? In this one representation, and there are many representations possible, in this one representation, the information is in time, in time frequency and in frequency. And we'll see some examples of that. So I'll give you an example. I'll start with an example of information in time. And I'd like, I, I like to start with this example. So this is a Ferrari. And it goes from zero to 60 miles per hour in five seconds flat. Now, at one time, it was touted as a car that was too fast to race. But then other cars came along. And these, these, these high-end cars go from, uh, from zero to 60 miles per hour in shorter times, 2.1 seconds, 2.2 seconds, and so on and so forth. Why are these times different for these different cars? Well, the answer is simple. These are complex machines. Each one is designed differently. So it turns out our vocal production process is even more complex. Here is an example of, let me play this. Three, three, three. It's a nine-year-old boy saying three, three, three. When we say a word like three, the first sound is th. We produce the sound by creating an obstruction in our vocal tract, building up air pressure behind it and releasing it suddenly. The vocal folds are not vibrating. The very next sound is er, and that sound requires your vocal folds to vibrate at full potential. Your vocal tract has muscles. They have a certain inertia. Everyone's vocal tract has some inertia. And in going for the vocal folds to go from a state of complete rest to a state of complete motion takes a small, a very small amount of time. And that time is called the voicing onset time. It is different for different people. It is not only different for different people, it is different for the same person for different combinations of sounds. That makes this characteristic very unique. This is a characteristic in time. So let's go on ahead and see some of the examples of information in frequency and time frequency. I'm going to play out this very beautiful song to you. Beautiful. Let's look at the spectrogram. How complex is this? How complex is this? If I wanted to artificially reproduce it, I would not be able to do it. And I'll show you some of my best efforts. I take a small snippet of this. And by the way, you, all these fine details that you see are in time and frequency. So this is information in time and frequency in this one representation. 
So here are my attempts to recreate a small snippet of this sound. I start with this, not close. Getting close, this is a real one. This is the closest I could get, <laughs> mathematically. <laughs> and this is just a small snippet of the sound produced by this person. Every person's voice is unique. Every person's voice is unique. Let's look at another example. This is a singer from India. At one time, she, I think, held the record for having the sweetest voice in the world. And this is her voice. If you compare the two voices side by side, nothing would match. Nothing would match. There, there, there's such detail in these voices. And incidentally, what she's singing, and this, this song was recorded in 1977, she's saying, my name will be lost. This face will change. My voice is my only identity. The information in voice is in the microfeatures. And we use artificial intelligence to discover and extract these microfeatures. I was talking about representations. So I'll show you information in a couple of other representations. Very interesting. These, uh, this is the Queen of England. And these are examples of her voice 50 years apart when she was very young at age 35 31. 35 years ago, my grandfather broadcast the first of these Christmas messages. One of the features of growing old is heightened awareness of change. Can you hear the difference? So this representation is called the constant Q spectrogram. And the arrows point to the same word spoken 50 years apart. And you can see the differences. The pitch has shifted, the harmonics are smeared, and there are other differences. Here's yet another representation. These are pitch pulses of three different people saying the word a. Uh. And do you see the difference in pattern between the ones on the sides, the people on the sides, and the one in the center. The, people in, the person in the center has Parkinson's. So, and the, the markers show up on this representation. That's Hitler in 1935 addressing the Nazi party. And what do you see in his voice in the same representation? People suspected from video evidence that he had Parkinson's. This shows that he might have had Parkinson's indeed. Your environment ha leaves signatures on your voice. This is an example. If you're surrounded by glass, it causes reverberation and causes a smear in the voice signal. You can see the smear on the spectrogram. And by backtracking from that smear, you can actually trace the materials of the enclosure around the person and also the dimensions of the person, uh, the, the room. So, and a lot more is possible using voice analysis. Um, your skull is closely related to your face. Your skull is also very closely related to your vocal chambers. So is your face. It is therefore possible to trace this, the contours of your face from the voice. It is possible to deduce the structure of your skull from voice. Your skull is connected to your skeleton. It is therefore possible to deduce the structure of your skeleton from the voice. It's possible to get your height and weight. I can get your BMI. I can fill in your skeletal structure. It is then possible to reconstruct your stature or your physical form from voice. And one day we hope we are going to be perfect at doing that, or near perfect at doing that. Where are we today? 
Last year, in 2018, in September in Tianjin, this technology was demonstrated live. About 1,000 people tried it out. And uh, one part of the technology was a virtual reality demo where people were wearing a headset and saying something, and their face was recreated in 3D. You could pick it up and examine it. This year, in February, we reversed the technology, and we recreated Rembrandt's voice from his facial portraits. This was done in collaboration with JWT, Walter Thompson, and Rijksmuseum, and ING in Netherlands. What's the future of this technology? Your voice will help machines know you better, perhaps more, better than even you can know yourself. This is a book that I've just finished writing. It's going to be published very soon by Springer. It spells out the technology in about 400 pages. Um, and hopefully it'll be out very soon in a couple of months. Thank you very much.